two, one, guess what? This is 2OF Entertainment. Welcome to the Lost Dollar Business Club, where we talk about business, 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 and not just business. We talk about what makes businesses go up and what makes businesses go down. If you're interested in businesses, this is where it is. We talk about the global economy. We talk about global politics. We talk about everything and anything business related that affects your life on a global scale as well as a local scale. And don't miss after the show, Lost and Found. It's a very exciting show. We have one of our fame, favorite, favorite, oh. and famous guests, but, David. Well, no. We definitely have a favorite. <laughs> well, it's great to have great to have John and David back. We've got the yep. whole crew ready yes. to talk. The guy standing, right. a great uh, author and economist uh, right. and thinker, who uh, who talked uh, talked to us last time a yeah. few weeks ago about rentier capitalism and the corruption of capitalism. Topics that our audience loved, and we wanted to bring him back to talk about, to expand on the privatization of the commons, right. which obviously is a, is a really big issue, not just uh, in the West, but everywhere. And uh, Guy's going to give us the, the lowdown on that. All right. Okay. So should we, should we just pay, pay the rent before the, we... Pay the uh, rent, okay, please. Right? Let's pay the rent pay and the bring rent. Guy in. Okay. Get the freedom and the flexibility of remote work in the lucrative tech industry. Bend your life around, around the world. Bendicoot is the premier course and community for thriving in a remote tech career. Join the revolution today. Bendicoot.com, official partner of the Lost Dollar Business Club. Very All nice. Right. Hey, David, hey, do David. you have the studio? Do you have a studio audience with you again today, like we did on uh, No Snobs or Knobs? So when guy comes in, they can clap. Um, no, no, not yeah. at the moment. No, but right, he's, but he's up. Did some amazing okay. work on that on that advertisement. Well done, David. Well done. All right, well, let's, well, let's, you, you, let's. You deserve it, Michael. You deserve it. Uh, you deserve a break today at McDonald's. Okay, let's bring guy in because nobody cares what we have to say. They want to listen to guy. So oh, let's guys. bring him in. Guy, welcome back. We're excited to have you. Um, yeah, welcome. And we're going to sit here and look pretty and let you just do your thing. By the way, though, everybody I think bought the book "Can't Happen Here." I know David and I did. Loved it. I like I sat down one afternoon and read the whole thing while I was having a cigar. Loved the book. It was a great book. Eerie book. It's a, yeah, it's eerie, a great book. Very eerie. It's becoming more and more relevant every day. Yeah, it truly is the Trump yeah. book. That's what I call it. It's it a Trump is. playbook. Absolutely. Yeah. Some yeah. of the yeah, speeches maybe. in that book could come from Trump. It's just yes. absolutely incredible. The yeah. analogy you think he was actually is, able to read it? Do you think Mr. Trump has actually uh, read a book? Uh, well, Did that's a debatable it? issue. We could discuss <laughs> that. Uh, but I doubt it, David, because uh, the man doesn't seem to have any resemblance to truth. I see that he described January 6th, uh, 2021, when five people were killed. As a mm -hmm. day of love, a day of yeah. love. I heard that this it. morning, yeah. yeah. Uh, incredible. I mean, a man who, yeah. who's standing for president of the United States that has the remotest resemblance to knowledge of the English language or let alone truth is frightening, really frightening. But he, but he only uses the best words, which is important Not to sure. know. Um, but the problem with that's going to be is, unfortunately, Miss Harris is playing ostrich. And because she's yeah. playing ostrich, Trump is going to win. So I hate yeah, to tell everybody, but it looks like the the orange man's going to be president, people. So there's nothing you're going to do about oh, it. Oh, Democrats oh, are playing oh, ostrich. Things before they need to be called. Just, I'm, uh, I'm calling yeah, it. Trump's going to be president. It's we got to suck up to him now. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Very, well, as I say, you know, well, I've, I've, well, I've, I've, already, I've already ordered my brown shirt. That's coming in from <laughs> Amazon. They're, they're going to okay. be sold out within a week. Yeah, so dramatic. All right, well, guy, we've got we've got something that's that's affected. It, it, it was related to Brexit, and it's related to what's happening in the United States, which is the privatization of the commons. And you call it even in the corruption of capitalism book, the plunder of the commons. So, give us give us your thoughts on give us the first of all the background around what you mean by the plunder of the commons and and how this has kind of happened progressively without anybody really noticing until it's almost too late. 
Well, if I may, I'm going to start with a little history because uh, the commons is often misunderstood. Many people who don't know anything about the commons imagine that it's, you know, the green in the village or where everybody, you know, meets up uh, to have a social event. But the commons actually goes back to ancient history and it was partly um, a matter of access to resources that belong to everybody, but it w became part of common law in AD 529, when the new emperor of the Roman Empire said, all the laws are in a mess. I'm going to set up a, a commission of legal experts and they must come up with a system of common law. And among the things that they did was they came up with saying that there are four types of property. There is private property, which belongs to the individual. There's state property, which belongs to the state or the government. There's nobody's property, res nullius, and there is common property. And the common property includes soil, the land, the sea, the air, the minerals under the ground, the things that we inherit that have been bequeathed to us over generations as a commons. And this became enshrined in common law, which is part of the United States Constitution and British Constitution, and in fact, every democracy in the world. And it became enshrined even more strongly with the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest, which was sealed uh, on November 6, 1217. And the, the Charter actually asserts that everybody has a right to subsistence in the commons and a right to work in the commons and that the commons must be preserved by the sovereign the ruler. In the case of, of those regimes in those days, that meant the monarch. But any government has to act as the steward of the commons. In other words, to preserve the value, if not enhance the value of the commons, and pass it down to successive generations. Very critical point. So that the government is meant to act as the steward of the commons, and in order for it to function well, the steward must be confronted by what I've called in my work, gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are those bodies who are responsible for holding the stewards to account. In other words, being the, the bodies of the commoners to hold the stewards to keeping their, their word as trustees. Now, the commons traditionally were, first of all, enclosed. We have the famous enclosure of land, the Tudors in Britain, and the enclosures that led to Karl Marx being radicalized in the Moselle Valley, and we have the enclosure by governments all over the world. And most importantly in my narrative was the enclosure of the sea and the seabed. And I've written a book called The Blue Commons. And the incredible thing was that for many, many generations, ever since antiquity, the sea, and the sea, don't forget, covers 71% of the world's surface, right? The sea was regarded as a commons. It belonged to everybody. And uh, the benefits had to be shared equitably in principle and so on. But in 1982, a remarkable uh, event happened when the United Nations, after 17 years of agonizing negotiations, passed what's called UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, described it as the most significant legal instrument of the 20th century. And it was. And what it did was it enclosed 138 million square kilometers 
of seabed and sea, making them the, na the, the, the ownership was given to the countries. So 200 nautical miles from the seashore of the United States or Britain or France or whatever belonged henceforth to the government, to the country. Okay, this was an act of enclosure that dwarfed all previous enclosures. Now, the importance of an enclosure by a government is you then create the basis for privatization. Once it becomes state property, then the state or those who capture the state can privatize it. So they can sell it to individuals and they can sell it to corporations. Now, we have five types of commons. The natural commons, which is what I've just been describing, the sea, the air, the land, and, and minerals, and so on. And you have a social commons, which are inherited because they've been bequeathed. All the social institutions of society that have been built for the commons by the commoners, and they are shared, owned by all of us collectively and as equals. And you have the cultural commons, all the institutions of our culture and the arts and so on. And you have uh, the, the civil commons, the, are the legal frameworks, which are part of our common law system. And, and, and then you have the education or intellectual commons. Education and the institutions of education have been handed down to us or should have been handed down to us as commons. The original universities were set up by commoners back in the 11th and 12th centuries, the great Bologna and Oxford and Paris and so on. They belonged to the commoners. But sadly, all of these things have been enclosed by governments, privatized, and then most significantly have been commodified. In other words, once you privatize something, then it can be bought and sold and exchanged and merged and the rest of it. And that's where rentier capitalism comes in because finance powerfully has been enabling to buy up things that were part of our commons and systematically turning them into private property for making huge rentier incomes above what would be in a free market. So you have this process of enclosure, privatization, commodification, and financialization, which is where we are today. And this, this process has dispossessed us, the commoners, of our birthright, if you like. And it's a very important political thing because I believe that we should be as progressive people should be demanding compensation for the plunder of our commons. And that is the, the sort of underlying thesis of, of my work in, in the various books. And I believe that with rentier co capitalism, our income distribution system globally and within individual countries. I see David's in, from the Netherlands. I was in the Netherlands in Amsterdam recently talking about this, and they understand the loss of the commons there just as much as we do and, and you should do in the United States. And it's, it's a political problem because rentier capitalism has taken what were the commons and turned them into a source of vast revenue for the plutocracy and the elite who are sucking out, extracting revenue from what were our commons, while we, the commoners, and in particular the precariat, the group I've been writing about, which is probably my most famous book, the precariat has been losing and losing and losing. And we will not see a change of that that situation of the precariat, unless we have a change of the income distribution system as such. And that is the, the premise of some of my proposals. Guy, don't you, do, you know, in the, original, in the original space where you're talking about governments taking over and, uh, and, and um, taking over these commons, don't you think, or maybe what do you think about 
the alter like what what's the alternative to governments doing that? I mean, what other organization? I mean, is it because the governments have been corrupted or they're bureaucratically inefficient, <laughs> or uh, you know, what's the who's going to stand up for the common man at a at a at a national or even global level to restore the commons and and the wealth from it to the people? Well. If I if I go back to as an example, I could give other examples, but the the the, the best example in in a sense is what's happened to the sea. The man who began negotiations, uh, a man called Prado, a Maltese diplomat, he believed that the, all the sea and everything in it and under it was the common property of humanity. Of mankind, as he put it initially, and when he saw how the big powers, the Soviet Union and the United States in particular at that time, were negotiating to turn it into a, a privatization bonanza, he lamented terribly how it had all all gone wrong. But there were certain things that he managed to retain so that there was an international seabed authority set up, which was responsible for saying that there should be no deep sea mining until there was the establishment of ecological sustainable rules and rules for sharing the benefit for the whole of humanity. It was a, a mechanism set up that deliberately said, these are our commons, okay? If you're going to turn it into a source of private profits for multinational capital, you must have mechanisms for sharing the benefits. Okay. Unfortunately, 28 years of negotiations and prevarication led the International Seabed Authority to reach no conclusion. And I campaigned last year and this year for the replacement of the Secretary General of the ISA, who had be essentially become uh, uh, a servant of a few mining corporations. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you that last month he got thrown out. And, and mm -hmm. I'm, I was really chuffed about that. Mm -hmm. Because the, there are governance rules that could protect the commons and protect the ethos of the commons. The commons still exist in some places in different forms, uh, but they've been reduced. Now, there, historically, there were mechanisms, cooperatives, there were guilds, there were institutions for protecting the commons and having rules of access, use, who was a commoner, who was not a commoner. And you, you had rules. And of course, an American economist was you wasn't an originally an economist, Eleanor Ostrom. She got the Nobel Prize for coming up with rules of governance of commons. And that, funnily enough, she, she learned her bag of tricks, if you like, bag of uh, knowledge from studying a, a water system not far from here in, in the mountains in Switzerland that had been preserved as a commons throughout its history, it still is today. And it still has common rules, who has access, who shares the benefits, who rule helps, uh, rules set up on, on management and so on. And there are various systems around the world which are still going and we need to strengthen those. We need to strengthen the sense of governance. We need to revive the commons, turn areas that have been denuded by privatization back. and when it, with music and uh, that's always helps but, yeah. but, <laughs> but, uh, and i think i think the ethos of commoning a word that would have not surprised people in the middle ages but nowadays has gone out of the uh, english language if you type in a word document uh, commoning it automatically uh, converts it into communing. But commoning was, was doing work on a shared basis. And we still have a respect for commoning, shared activities. 
And in the final chapter of my book, The Politics of Time, I indicate how different systems of allotments are existing still in many countries, including the Netherlands and Britain and the United States and Italy and so on, which allow for shared activities. And I think we can revive that because many of the most rewarding aspects of work are in shared activities. I'm, I'm speaking from a Swiss village where we, we regard commoning activities as part of the great joy of being in the community. Very cool. I have a question uh, for I, you, oh, if yes, I may. Sir. So when you talk about commoning, let's just, let's get off of this planet for one second, because it, that's, they have commoning in the commons and the commons, well, that's never happening. Like, I'm sorry, it's just the governments aren't gonna let it, the, the, the bureaucrat, everybody, that's done. Now we're going out into Pluto and Mars and, you know, the moon and whatever. So in theory, for mankind, that would be all common space. So are we going to see that, what happened here on our little blue marble, third rock from the sun? We're going to see that someone's going to go and plant the flag and go, this is mine. Well, uh, I didn't mean to say what I'm about to say, Stephen, but... Um, okay. When my book, when my book on the Blue Commons came out, right. one of the wealthiest, wealthiest Americans uh, wrote to me and and said how it, how he, he liked the book and the rest of it. And right. he he's a multi billionaire, and he said, "Guy, now would you please write a book about the Commons in outer space?" And I, know, wow. I wrote back to. I wrote back to him, and I, I, it was, his name is Mark Benioff, who's the, the chief executive of, of Salesforce. And I said, Mark, the, the, the thought of doing that is just one, one degree too far. I'm much too grounded. <laughs> in, in, in the sea is, is already a big adventure. I mean, right. I, don't, I don't agree with your premise, though, Stephen. I, I do believe that a lot of people understand the commons when you right. talk about them, okay? I, I, I've spoken to numerous audiences, and to start with, quite often, they, commons, what the hell are they? You know, uh, puzzlement. But once you elaborate and you, you they, they say, yeah, of course, of course, of course. And very quickly, you find that there's common ground, if you like, to coin a phrase, common ground among people of very different class backgrounds. You get your, your middle class salaried people who say, yes, we need a commons. We need the commons because that unites society, that gives a sense of social solidarity. It has ecological uh, implications. It draws us back to a sense of reproduction. People can understand that from various backgrounds. For the precariat, people who are facing a life of chronic insecurity, the commons traditionally was what was called the poor's overcoat. Okay. It provided a system of informal social protection where people could, in extremis, survive and build something approaching a dignified life. And I believe that, that progressive politics lost its soul in the early 20th century when you had pro-capitalist political movements wanting everything to be privatized and you had the social democrats, the socialists and the uh, communists all thinking that everything should be run by the state. Right. So that the com what were the commons and the commoning was squeezed out. Neither side of that political divide gave a damn about what happened to the to the commons. I think that was a terrible can, historical mistake. Can I, can I just ask you? Can I go back to this thing about the sea, right? So, yeah. so let's say, I mean, how do you envisage that? I mean, is there going to be a central bank, for instance, that would collect all the money from all the all the wealth which is on in the oceans and that and, and that would be distributed to everybody i mean it, it sounds it's it sounds very you know very kumbaya but i mean how would that actually work 
How do you envisage that, ah. that it could work? Okay. Thank you very much for that question. Because if you look at, at the books, the final chapters uh, try to give the answer to that, that question. Well, unfortunately, well, I, I haven't you... read the book, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> it's a good, it's a, I'm, not, I'm not knocking it. I'm, I'm saying it's a good question. Uh, the, the thing is that we have a situation where we can um, envisage setting up commons, what I call commons capital funds, where you okay. put levies on those who are gaining from taking and making profits from various type of commons, or that are depleting our commons by their uh, practices. So that you could build a commons fund. Now, as it happens, we have a model. We have a model which is the Norwegian, uh, which is essentially a sovereign wealth fund, the Norwegians were very wise when uh, they discovered North Sea oil and Britain discovered North Sea oil, whereas Britain privatized it and gave, handed it over to multinationals, uh, knocked down prices. And today, ironically, it's owned mainly by Chinese state corporations, ironically. The Norwegians said, we keep ownership of our oil. It is a national asset. And we will charge companies a rent and we will put the royalties into a fund that builds up. OK, so they they basically have a levy on their, their oil, but you don't need to do it with just with oil. You could do it with any commons resource that's being depleted or used. Another model is the Alaska Permanent Fund, which was set up. Uh, in 1976 by a sort of maverick Republican uh, governor who, is a, who joined our association uh, later, uh, Jay Hammond, his name was, and he set this fund up. He said, the Alaskan oil belongs to all Alaskans. And if, if the corporations are going to be making profit, then they're going to have to pay the royalty into this fund. And as we build the fund up, we pay out everybody a, a dividend from the fund. Now you can do that with all sorts of things. And I've recently, I've where I've talked about the commons in, in Korea, where they really understand the commons because Korea was set up uh, at, on the basis of commons back in BC 3334, incredibly. Anyhow, in, in, in Korea, they, ver they have various communities where they, they've taken the resources that are part of the commons and use produced from those resources, but the profits go into the fund. And as the funds build up, they invest in sustainable uh, investments, ecological investments. And as the fund grows up, paying out dividends. There's one with one beautiful example, which is done with sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers, which is a delicacy in China, and therefore sells at very high prices. So they, they, they do commoning, collecting all the sea cucumbers each year in one island, and all the profits from selling the sea cucumbers go into this fund and then are distributed as a basic income to every resident uh, of, of the island. It's, it's a model that you can expand on. And I believe, for example, that we should have a carbon, a carbon tax. People who are polluting the atmosphere tend to be the wealthy. They tend to be the ones causing most of the pollution, whereas the poor are paying the price in worse health, worse uh, air, worse uh, environment, and so on. And in a sense, you say a carbon tax should be paid into the, into the fund and recycled as paying out a part of a, a dividend or a basic income, because if it's not recycled, it's regressive. A carbon tax will not be popular and will not be introduced. But there in British Columbia, they've, they've understood that. And therefore, they promise that with a carbon tax, they will recycle the revenue at equal payments to every individual in, in the state, in the, in the province. And in a sense, we, we see this something similar like to that in, in Switzerland. We, we all pay uh, a carbon tax, 
but we get a rebate which is equal and therefore it is progressive it reduces inequality but it's taxing something that we should be wanting to reduce and again to go back to stephen's point this isn't utopian uh, idealistic uh, uh, you know something that you couldn't imagine being done what is stopping us stephen is politics and oh, no, we, I agree need with that. A movement. we need right. a movement for the commons and i i believe that as the precariat as a class grows that movement is growing as well and there's a lot of energy out there and if we're having any sense of optimism about the future then i think a commons politics is going to be the way forward rather than a laborist uh, politics of the old social democrats the democrats in the united states the, the labor parties that's why david speaking from netherlands he's seen the uh, the social democrats almost wiped out uh, because they're not addressing what sort of future we need yeah well every, everybody in uh, europe in general seems to be going to the right so as much as you uh, could maybe be considered to be a very quite a left wing point of view about the cooperative, which I which, which I really love. I find it incredibly exciting and 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 you know and, and for me a very obvious way to move forward. Um, it would seem that that message is totally ignored or you know or drowned out by this very you know, um, for example, in the US by by the the Make America uh, Great Again movements, or in Holland, by uh, you know by the right wing Dutch. Yeah, they don't they, they don't want they don't want anybody else to have the money. That's uh, that's that's not good politics. That the left the the, the 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 rhetoric here is that the left is finished, that it has nothing to offer. And that's uh, so, so, in so, a sense, that right, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so, so does that I mean that you? Sorry, God, does that mean that you're whistling in the wind then? No. Um, I, I don't know if I said this last time, Stephen, so if I, if I did... It's okay, please. you can repeat yourself for the people that didn't watch this. Yeah, show. repeat. <laughs> but um, I wrote this book, The Precariat, in, 90, in 2011, and it came out in early 2011. And, and on what page one... I said that unless uh, unless the insecurities, needs, and aspirations of the precariat are recognized uh, by political movements, we're going to see the emergence of a political monster. And in early 2016, I was uh, I, I was surprised. I received an email set from somebody who said the Bilderberg group would like to invite you to speak at a, a retreat that we will be holding in Bremen in Germany in a castle and I thought it was a lefty friend of mine uh, sending me up because the Bilderberg group was the set up after the Second World War and essentially is is the organization of the ultra rich the ultra powerful political right the the establishment right okay so i didn't take any notice and then a couple of days later i was in the kitchen and the phone went and a man said i'm the, the secretary general of the bilderberg group and we sent you an invitation and you haven't answered and i said well i thought it was a joke and he said, no, we really would like you to come and talk to us about the precariat and the politics of it. And I said, well, you know, send me another invitation and I'll think about it. So I, I consulted all my, my respectable left people around Europe and a couple in the United States. And every single man and woman said, Guy, you've got to go. You've got to go. Do it. So imagine... I was given the VIP treatment, taken taken to this very fa fancy place. There were about a hundred people in the in this chateau, and there were demonstrations outside. People objecting to them, understandably, and I felt very strange. And then I was 
sitting, standing uh, on the rostrum and the chief executive of Deutsche Bank stood up and said, well, the next session is already well known in the German media because it's on the precariat. Uh, although they don't know who's meant to be here, there's only one person, so it has to be. He said, boxing out of the left corner, the guy's standing. Mm -hmm. And I stood up and I said, thanks very much. And there, six feet in front, I think it was six or nine feet in front of me, looking at me with his pencil raised, was Henry Kissinger. Now, I'm of a generation where when I was a student, Henry Kissinger was public enemy number one. So there I was talking about the dangers of the growth of the precariat. And we had the head of the CIA, the head of MI6, there were a couple of kings, there were three prime ministers, there was the head of IMF, the head of the World Bank, head of NATO. There were, you know, it, all those people that one wouldn't want to spend too much time with in case <laughs> you turned your back. And of course, it was Chatham House rules, so I should be, I'm probably breaking the Chatham House rules in telling you this story. But I said, don't be surprised if Later this year, Brexit happens because nobody's taking any notice of the precariat, the people who are facing chronic insecurities. And don't be surprised if later this year, Donald Trump is elected. And of course, both of those things have happened. And what I was saying that day, and I've been saying in my, my books, is that the precariat has been growing and growing and growing for the last 40 years and is now the mass class. It's people who are chronically insecure. They don't have any rights. They're in fact losing the rights of citizens and they don't have a sense of the future. And I said that there are three factions in the precariat. The first faction I call the atavists. The atavists are people who feel that the past was better than their present. They are people who were belonging to old working class communities, old uh, working class families. They don't have a lot of formal education, but they feel that yesterday was better than today. These people will support neo-fascist populists like the Donald Trumps, like the Nigel Farages, like Wilders in the Netherlands, like Maloney in, in Italy, Marine Le Pen, etc. Orban, people like that. They are dangerous. My book is called The New Dangerous Class. The second group I call the nostalgics. These are people who feel they don't have a home anywhere. They're the migrants, they're the refugees, they're the minorities. They feel that they don't have a past, a present or a future. They won't support neo-fascist populists, but they keep their heads down. Every now and then they, it gets too much and you see days of rage and so on. I remember I was speaking in Stockholm once and, and there was huge outbreak by the migrant communities. Uh, because the pressures get too much. The third group I call the progressives. These are the young who are going to university, their parents, their teachers say, go to university, you will have a future, you will have a career. And they know they've bought a lottery ticket. And they come out of universities these days with a lot of debt, mostly, and realizing that they didn't get the right lottery ticket. Mm. Now, this group won't support neo-fascist populists either. And they have been looking for a new progressive politics, a progressive politics that says a future is coming, a promise of a future. Now, the left historically have always thrived only when they have offered an alternative future to the present. Now, you, David, sitting in the Netherlands, you will know very well that's not what the so-called left in the Netherlands has been doing recently. I have like, often come to the Netherlands and it's not being offered in Britain. It's not being offered by 
Kamala Harris or the goddering old Biden in the United States. And we are in a vacuum, in an interregnum, if you like, where in the, with Gramscian thoughts, you know, the old is dying, but the new is not ready to be born. We're in that period where there's a lot of discontent. And the bad news is that, of course, the atavist part have been huge. But the good news is this, they're getting older. They're passing through the system, whereas the progressive part of the precariat is growing by the day. It's growing by the day. Yesterday, I was doing interviews in, in Spain, uh, where my latest book has just come out in Spanish. And there is fantastic energy among the young educated in places like Spain. It's a matter of how long it takes before it becomes a powerful class-based movement with sufficient agendas, sufficient components that it will be a coherent political force. But I believe it's coming pretty quickly. If it, historically, the same thing happened when the proletariat was growing in the 19th and 20th centuries. To start with, people said, yeah, but they, they're all over the place and they're, 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 they've got no coherence. It took decades, but we need it much faster because things are so much faster today. But I believe that there's a hell of a lot of progressive energy out there. And it's a matter of harnessing it and saying to the, to the young, have backbone, have courage, take it on. You know, well, so why did they, so, our, our so guys, so why did they not? That. Guy, why did they not vote for Bre for why did they vote for Brexit? Because it they would didn't. appear that, yeah, exactly. They they, they, they just didn't they just didn't bother. No, no, no the the point. Yes, uh, a very good question, David. I agree with that one question, and I've written about it. What happened in two thousand and sixteen is actually the British were offered a choice. They were offered a choice of Brexit going out with sovereignty and all that, you know, led by Michael Gove and, and obnoxious Boris, Boris Johnson, against uh, a coalition led by David Cameron, who was proposing a continuation of the austerity era he and his friend George Osborne had introduced. George Osborne, incidentally, was was at that, that uh, Bilderberg group meeting. Basically, you had a choice of two negatives. You had terrible options. You weren't being given a, a decent option. And many people just didn't vote. But I totally Cameron, agree with your opinion. Do you think that Cameron was very arrogant about it? He thought, well, nobody's Yes, he was. he was. He was. He was. He was. He was. And, and, and the, the, what was a, a sense, a more sensible position would have been, look, we need to reform the European Union. We need yeah. to make it more democratic. We Both need to make it more egalitarian, less yeah. neoliberal in its orientation. It isn't a perfect institution. It, in fact, has been captured by finance and by by the right. But we must fight with from within. That that would have been a better stance. And in a sense, I, I was asked afterwards to become an economic advisor to John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn. And Jeremy was, I mean, I like Jeremy a lot, but he, he wasn't a very good a politician as a, as a leader. But he was, he was in the same sort of uh, ambivalent position. He's a cosmopolitan, he's an internationalist, and not a, a nationalist or, a, or a, you know, a populist. And he couldn't quite come to the formula which would make it that, that he was saying what I've just tried to say myself. I, I think the Brexit debate is, is a very good illustration of a situation that we've had in the last 15 years or so, which I call uh, primitive rebels. People know what they're against more than they know what they're for. There's more unity yeah, yeah. In, in that sense. Yeah. And that, I think, it historically is always a phase that has to be gone through. 
People know what they're against. They're losing the commons. They're losing security. They're losing a sense of being in control of their lives. But they're not sure what's the answer. Now, I think that takes time to become articulated, uh, to become part of the popular discourse, to seep through into universities, into festivals and things like that. But I think it's coming. And, and that's where my uh, optimism, if you like, uh, stems from. This sort of energy out there, which is a mixture of anger, a mixture of desperation, and, and the beginnings of a sense of wanting an ecological future, wanting a more egalitarian future, which I think is, is an exciting set of developments. So where, where is this group going to sit then? Are they going to sit in the middle? Sorry? Are they going to be... Sorry? Uh, will, it, will this new movement, this new young movement coming through, are they going to sit in the middle and, ex and accept that, uh, you know, that, 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 that there are people who are going to always be rich and there are people who are always going to be poor? No, I think, I think there's, there's a new energy for redistribution. There's a new energy for wanting uh, to reduce wealth inequality, which is horrendous. And wealth inequality uh, has grown much more than income inequality. And the value of wealth relative to national income has multiplied in, in recent decades. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of desire for a politics, what I call a politics of time, so that to enable more people to have more control of their time. And, and there's a lot of uh, energy around the commons in nature. And yeah. it's coming in strange places. I mean, I, I, I give you another anecdote. We're, I'm a founder and now honorary president, which means older, uh, <laughs> of, of, yeah, of the Basic Income Earth Network. And we have uh, international congresses in various places in the world. And in 2016, we held our, our congress in Seoul. And a man came up to me and he said, excuse me, but could you explain what basic income is? And he asked me all the standard questions about it. And he said, I like it. I, I, I agree with it. I'm going to stand for governor of my province on basic income. And I said, well, uh, that's great. I, what's your name? You know, I, I, it really was that, that sort of conversation. Anyhow, the, 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 we had our Congress in Hyderabad in 2019. And by that stage, he had an entourage with him and he came to the Congress and he'd been elected governor of his province. And immediately he introduced a basic income for all young people aged 16 to 24. 125,000 young people now receive a basic income in his province. Before he stood, they said, this will never happen. It's a joke. You can't. You can't have it. Now it's done. Okay. So he came up to me and he, we had a better discussion. And obviously I treated him with much more respect. And he was now a governor. <laughs> And he said, Guy, I'm going to stand for president of South Korea. So I said, well, yeah, OK, you know, good luck. But he said, would you please write some articles for newspapers? I said, sure, sure, of course, you know. Anyhow, he stood for president and I followed the election and the rest of it. And it, it took place and he, he came to the runoff. All the other candidates, except the far right and he, were the final two candidates for president of the country. Okay, a rapidly rising country, as you know. And he did fantastically, but he didn't win. And he came to the Congress that we held last November. Uh, no, November 23, yes. And... He stood there in the front of the rostrum and he said, I failed. And I put my hand up and I w went up to speak. And I, I turned to him and in front of, there were about a thousand people in the audience. And I, I, I turned to him and I said, no, 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 no. You didn't fail. 
you went from zero in 2016 to getting 49.5% of the vote in your country. Any politician in the world would regard that as success. Getting 49.5% of the popular vote in your country. And I said, you will win next time. And this early this year, his party swept the parliamentary elections. They won big. And I'm convinced he will be president, the next president of Korea. The same things are happening in places, very strange places like Thailand. Thailand, now the biggest party is the precariat party. They're so popular that the king and the, the far right banned it, even though they've got 132 members of parliament. So I, when I met them in, in Bangkok a couple of months ago, I said, well, the next thing you're going to have to do is change your name and, and be the same but with a changed name. And they'll have to keep banning you and banning you because you have the popular vote. You have the popular support. You have the streets. Mm -hmm. Now, this sort of thing, if you'd said to me, David, five years ago, this what I just described would happen, I would say, I can keep dreaming. I can keep dreaming. But these are realities. These are realities. We are in a, a period where we could have a very dark night. If Trump is reelected, if Farage comes in, if Wilders, etc., we could go to another era of fascism, authoritarianism, support for genocide and domicide in in the Middle East and elsewhere. We 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 could be in the, for a terrifying a period of fascism. We all know that. That's why we're talking to each other because we are frightened by that. We are frightened by it. And there's a 50-50 chance, I suspect, that we could have another dark period. But we must nurture a new progressive vision of a future and then let the people who have got the charisma and the energy to take that forward. And I think there's a good chance of that too. So let me ask you this question, because, you know, you have, let's say out of the 8 billion people on the planet, we've got a billion people who are, you know, no, no worries. Everything is good. You know, they hang out with the Illuminati, the lizard people, and however you want to look at it. You've got 7 billion people who are your precarious, if you will, that worry. And you've got under the precarious, you have a lower precarious, which is like they can't afford health care and food Lumpen. and everything else. Right. Lumpen, yeah. So here's, okay. So my question then becomes at some point, Comes, it becomes like France back when Marie Antoinette it was like, let them eat cake. They're going to get a little tired of it. And at some point, if, if things don't change, whether it happens tomorrow, or it happens over 100 years, you know, when 7 billion people want to take a picnic, you're not stopping them. So, you know, I, I think the leaders and the wealthy don't see it that way. They see it. They'll just, they're under our control. They'll do what they say. But I, I don't think they read history books. And I don't think, to your point, unfortunately, the kids today are going to do anything. They're just too busy with their face and their phones. You know, the five or six that want to be activists, that's not going to help. So I, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, I don't see like there's a silver line for, for the planet if you will, because no one's really trying to do anything. I mean, you are, other people are, but as a whole, Norway's sovereign wealth fund does not give back to the Norwegians. That I know, because I have a friend who's, you know, we talk about it all the time. Alaskan sovereign wealth fund, Alaska is the only state in the United States that actually has its own sovereign wealth fund. They give back a check to the residents um, every year, but Norway does it. Norway's at what, the $1.7 trillion. They see nothing of that. They just keep growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. So until governments wake up or until they start listening to you, if, if you will, and they go, you know, we really need to look at this. Um, Andrew, whatever, Yang, I guess, was gonna be running for president on basic income. Okay, an interesting thing, Americans like, oh, that's, com it's not communism. It's like, we just get people lift it up but we it seems that people don't want to lift them up it sounds good they all like it and they'll go you know to a charity and write a check but when it comes to reality of it nobody really wants to lift anybody up it's how I, it's that's what it seems you know and when i travel the world 
you know, I travel in a, in a high circle and they don't really care about the poor people. And I'm always shocked by that because I'm like, without these, these people you consider poor, you don't have what you have. Because at some point, you know, the pitchforks come out. And I don't know if anybody's really looking at it in that respect. That's just that simple. So I don't know, you're the expert. I'm not. No, I mean, the, the, you're making valid concerns. Um, and in my Corruption of Capitalism book, I, I begin by saying that one of the things I've noticed is that some of the wealthiest people in the world fear the pitchforks. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's what you're alluding to. They fear that the people could suddenly rise up uh, right. against them. But let me let me begin by um, correcting you or, or giving my version of, of nice. what's happening in Norway. The Norwegian fund, as is now one of the biggest in, funds in the world after the Chinese fund, and since its inception and since its use in the investments and in the distribution of the profits, inequality has dramatically reduced in Norway. Norway today has the lowest inequality in the whole of Europe. Okay. And it, it has been done through careful use of the growing wealth of its fund. Not only by that, but essentially that. So that every, every decile of, of income earner below the top has been doing better than any other uh, decile, equivalent decile in the rest of Europe. That is, that is a remarkable uh, achievement for a small country. It is, it is a fantastically successful thing. I would, I would make even further improvements. I've mentioned in my book several improvements on it, but I think it's, it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic instrument that it has been. It's ecological. It's, it's been against uh, spending investment on weapons and, and polluting things. So it's, it's been a really big success. The, the, the second thing is, actually, I believe that there's a lot of openness, even in the United States, to basic income. And it's coming from some very strange uh, places. There are more than 100 experiments going on at this moment in the United States. There are more than 50 mayors of major cities in the United States who have signed up to wanting to introduce a basic income in their city. There are more than uh, more experiments of different kinds with people who've uh, single parents, there are artists, there are ex-convicts, there are various experiments going on in addition to major things. And one of the funny things is that some of the wealthiest people in the country who are not stupid but realize that things have to change are beginning to put in substantial amounts of money to support experiments. Sam Altman, who was also at that meeting in 2016, and I had a discussion with him on, on basic income, he's put $40 million dollars. $40 million into funding experiments on basic income in the United States. Chris Hughes, who was a co-founder of, of uh, YouTube, uh, no, Facebook, Facebook, co-founder with Mark Zuckerberg, he, 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 he got fed up with all the, that. He took his billion and is now spending his whole uh, resource base on funding basic income pilots in Africa and elsewhere, uh, where we're seeing, and we're seeing others, we're going to be having a summit, apparently, uh, in, in San Francisco in early next year. They were going to have it this month, but then they thought the, that they focus on the election. Uh, surprise, surprise. But they're going to have a summit where a lot of the people in Silicon Valley uh, are being invited to, to discuss it, okay? Now, of course, if some of the far right, the libertarians of the far right, they're hostile to it. But there's, a, again, a hell of a lot of energy out there 
about wanting to support it. And 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 we shouldn't be cynical. I'm not saying you're cynical or, or any of us are cynical in this discussion, but but we must not be cynical and thinking because it's not been done in the past, it can't be done in the future. You know, they've always said that. They've always said that about any progressive idea. And I think that, that we are in a phase where we're seeing a lot of expand. We've just finished a, a pilot in Wales, which the government of Wales introduced. And I'm, I'm immensely proud of the fact that the Prime Minister of Wales, he'd come to one of my lectures years ago, and he said, when I become leader, I'm going to introduce a basic income in Wales. So he did it. He did it. And for two years, everybody leaving an orphanage or a care home received a basic income each month for two years. It enabled them to become adults, become citizens, not feel chronically insecure and depressed and so on. It gave them a, a platform. And it's it's just concluded. And it's it's a fantastic, a fantastic thing. We've seen we've got one going in in Barcelona and various other places. So the, 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 it's a time of experimentation, but it's it it is a bubbling time. It's and that I think is is exciting. And I, oh, I think, all I of think us that's great. Really I just that. hope the revolution. I hope the revolution doesn't come before it, it gets to run its course. I just think people Absolutely. are getting fed up globally. Absolutely. So you know, I'm 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 literally just waiting. My mom used to say this when she was alive. It's like at some point you have a civil war, but I think it'll be a global civil war. People are like you know we've had it up to here with your flying cars and your champagne and your and boom. So and I think it's nice that I think the the wealthy one percent are waking up to this fact that like, hey, if we don't take care of these other people, there's more of them than us. Um, and that's not a good thing. So I think they're like realizing it's kind of like, I'm um, being from New York, I'll just do it. It's kind of like, eh, we're gonna pay them off. They're like, we're gonna give you a listen, this much, you leave us alone, we'll take care of you. And that's it. And you know what? I'm okay with that. As long as people get the basic needs, which is healthcare, food and education, I don't care how you do it. And the problem is we've gotten to a point where we don't give them the basic needs to be a human being. So when they do things, I'm like, you can't blame them. So, you know, no, I'm right. hoping we get to that point sooner than later. Now, whether the orange man gets in or not and does anything or doesn't do anything, no clue. And Miss Harris, as we talked about, I think right at the beginning of the show before we went live is playing ostrich. That's on them. Um, and I think the way we go will be, we'll either be speaking Mandarin in a few years or uh, to David's point, we'll be wearing um, brown shirts. Um, but you know, something's got to happen to the positive. And right now there's not a lot of positive out there. You know, Middle East is trying to do a lot of positive moving Israel aside. You know, just if you look at the GCC countries, they're doing a lot of positive. They're trying certain places in Europe, certain places in Asia, the rest of the world just seems like we're ready to implode. You know, it's like, eh, we'll just start over. So guys, you know, so uh, it's interesting. Go ahead, John. Uh, how does this factor into, you know, China, which you know, has a, you know, has the, the means, the institution, you know, the, the power to, why have they not introduced, uh, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm ignorant, but I don't, I don't think they've introduced basic income. In fact, you know, there's a, there's a huge, uh, I guess, uh, precariat, as you would describe it in, in China. And I guess the other part is, how do we fund this? So it's just not a, you know, a, a two-year pilot and then it just sort of dies uh, two two very big questions there uh, john um first first of all um my book uh, my books uh, particularly the precariat have been translated into mandarin and and simple chinese uh both in taiwan and in mainland china and i get i get a surprisingly large um set of emails and contacts and press interviews in China. It's true that there's a very large precariat. They have a movement now called Lying Flat. You may have, you may have heard of it, uh, which is a sort of rejection uh, of the exhortation to labor as hard as possible. And there is, there is a lot of uh, discontent about inequality. I, I, I think you have touched on the the most important geopolitical uh, 
crisis that we're facing. I mean, in the in the analogous period of the 1920s and 1930s, when we had a declining rentier state, essentially Western Europe, and a rising rentier state, which was the United States, you had a, a period in which the declining rentier state turned to fascism. And it was a very near run thing. And that's why the book was written by Sinclair Lewis. It can't happen here where it could have happened in the United States. We, today, we have a situation where the declining rentier state is the United States and the rising rentier state is China. I sometimes talk about Chindia because India is is rapidly moving into the same the same sphere of being a powerful rentier state. Now we we have a situation where the United States in those circumstances has seen a period in which it's empowered financial capital principally private equity in Wall Street and among the biggest investors in private equity, the Chinese. The Chinese who've been making vast profits from their export manufacturing goods and so on. And the, the reaction of successive governments, administrations in the, in the US has, to be, has been to turn to protectionism giving more subsidies to American corporations that it wants to be successful, propping up finance, and at the same time, leaving the growing precariat with declining living standards. And that, of course, is why you've seen stagnant and falling real wages over the past 40 years, occasional blip upwards, but essentially declining because they've lost a lot of rights. I just come back from Washington and I, I, you see that when, you, when you're not living in the United States, compared with when I first went many years ago, I go regularly, give lectures and so on, and I've seen a decline in the infrastructure, the decline of social civility, the declining health standards, a, a rising deaths of despair, rising suicide rates among young women, all the symptoms of of decline. And of course, your politics has, has been polluted, as we know, and we're about to see an, another presidential election along the same lines. So you're seeing that. Now, at the same time, China has not addressed well so far, the rising discontent with growing inequality and growing insecurity among its precariat. But I, I'm, I'm wondering which way that will go, because I don't believe that they are belligerent power at the moment. If they're pushed into a corner, they will become that. They have tried to write their, uh, their historically grounded uh, inequities. Like, for example, when UNCLOS was passed, we talked about that earlier, China got hardly any sea. The United States got 12 million square kilometers of sea given to it. China got less than 1 million. Is that fair? No, it's not. So that they, are, they do have sense of grievance and they do have a sense of uh, their Belt and Road initiative where they're they're shifting capital and labor overseas, which should worry us. So I think that that is a geopolitical crisis that has to be managed. But it won't be managed if we get the Trumps of the world just lashing out because they're blaming China for being a rising economic power and try to penalize them, stop them exporting their goods and all that stuff. If you do that, then we'll get into a, you know, you know, worse and worse geopolitical tensions. But at the moment, it's a dangerous point. And I, you know, John's absolutely right to, to raise it. They don't have all the answers, but I, the noises one hears from 
the discussions, and I've been invited to give talks in Shanghai and, and, and various places, that, that, that they understand the realities they're facing and uh, they have the means of addressing it. They now are a, a capitalist economy uh, with a powerful political uh, force. Uh, it, you know, it, you can be anti-Chinese or pro-Chinese, but I think we need a sense of realism by our states people, statesmen and stateswomen. <laughs> and I'm not sure that many of them are showing statesmanship, if you like, but, but it, it is a big crisis of rentier capitalism. Yeah. Good luck with that. If you want our states people to act like they have a clue, yes, uh, and, they, and they still think the earth is flat, and you know all yeah, the other God. other issues that we have. So, Guy, before we let you go, because we know you have a life, and we'd sit here all day yeah. with you. Um, final thoughts, anything, and then we'll have you back if you want, right after the election, if you want to come back. Um, I would have you come back before, but it'd be more fun after um, the Orange Man wins, because then we can all cry together. Um, but any final thoughts before you go and, and enjoy the rest of your weekend? No, I, I'm, my final thought, uh, Stephen, is, is that we must encourage a sense of the future, rebuild our imaginations, let ourselves be uh, futuristic in the way we think about these issues. I know there's, there are a thousand reasons for pessimism, but we, 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 it's the, you know, the classic thing about the triumph of the, of the will. Right. And, and, and I think that that's the message we should be taking to each other. I don't have it every day. You know, you don't have it every day. And that's why we need to encourage each other and, you know, our friends and people who are the younger generation who are seeking a way forward. And let's let's encourage that imagination because there are there's wonderful opportunities and, and that's we must we must not forget in a, in our pessimism. I agree with that. Thank you very much. Guy, it is always a pleasure. We love having you. Yes, thank you, Guy. You. We yeah, appreciate you being here. Working. Yeah, we love it. And we will see you if you want. We'll we'll invite you back after the election in November to hear your thoughts. Or we'll, like I said, we'll all cry in our scotches. Either <laughs> way. It works well for us. <laughs> so, no, good well, talking to you. Very nice question. It's a pleasure, my friend. Nice we'll see you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. I love that guy. He's the best. Guy's the best. All right. So yeah. the end, ending message from Guy is that we should be optimistic. If the orange man wins, aliens will invade us and we're all going to die. Okay. Now, on to, as we like to say, lost and found. What do you think? Ever Liz? wonder how millions vanish into thin air or how a single dollar can make all the difference? Join us on Lost and Found, where we dive into the wild world of financial mysteries. From misplaced fortunes to unexpected windfalls, we unravel the stories of people, companies, organizations, and even governments who've lost and found millions. Lost and found because every dollar has a story. Before we start a yeah. Lost and Found, I just want to thank our fans that actually did type stuff. We have one fan all the time watching all the live shows. So, Don, thank you. Um, number two, some of you might wonder what happened to Michael. Um, he took too much Viagra and he had to go to, and that was it. No, Michael had a family emergency during the show and, um, Michael had to leave. So just FYI, that's why Michael kind of tapped out in the middle of the show. So I didn't want anybody to like try to figure out what it was, uh, what was going on there. So there you go. But other than that, you're stuck with the three of us. So John, we haven't seen you for two, a fortnight. Why don't you tell us what you're, yeah. what you're, what you have in the lost and found file. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this week, uh, Raytheon, who is you know uh, a subsidiary of RTX, which is a you know huge uh, defense contractor, agreed right. to pay nine hundred and fifty million to resolve a you know a couple of different federal investigations: contract fraud, right. uh, anti-corruption, export control laws. Uh, you know, oh, every day in the United States. Okay. Yeah, uh, just <laughs> yeah. So they admitted to two major frauds affecting right. the. The DOD uh, contracts, including Patriot missile systems and radar systems. Right. They also, uh, you know, uh, admit, sort of admitted that involving uh, defective pricing in, in military contracts 
nice. with the government. So as well as illegal bribes to Qatari officials. I saw that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it just yeah, no more Daniel Jefferson. And, and the, the really nice thing is, guy wants us to be optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, it is what it is. So, All right. Yeah, so, when, so, so is that a go. lost lost right, dollar so, for them or a fair so, dollar for the? I don't know, John. What do you think? Well, I don't know. I, I you know, suddenly a do, like mm -hmm. nearly a you know, a billion dollars worth of fines for 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 them. Uh, yeah. Obviously, they're comfortable paying it because they probably charge it right back to the government in God, another country. Yeah. Next week, so, next week, uh, bill. Yeah. yeah. Toilet, nine hundred and fifty million. So yeah, found, found money for Raytheon. Then okay, I love it. That's great. Well, here's something I thought. Then and it's too bad Michael's not here for this one. But I thought this this was funny. John's gonna love this. Tesla's Optimus robots were operated remotely at last week's um, CyberCab event. There's a whole article in Bloomberg um, that was on October 14th that talks about how Tesla used humans to remotely control his robots because they didn't technically work. And I just think Tesla, I know Donald Trump loves Elon, but it's like the biggest Ponzi scam in the world. I'm sorry. There's nothing positive. Now, SpaceX, I'm impressed with um, that they have that little rocket that goes up and down. But uh, the rest of the stuff, not so much. So yeah. I just I just wonder, you know, yeah. whether or not you just thought, I'll just do it and no one will notice, or he just didn't care. Did he probably doesn't care. To, didn't care to get caught out. No, because Donald Trump is going to have him be um, like a business star now, and they're going to just governmentize everything. They're going to take all the companies over, and Elon's going to run them all. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, so there goes America. Anyway, yeah. some South African guy is going to be um, one of our czars now. We got that going for us. Here comes a part time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> David? Okay. Yeah, well, this is mine. This is mine. Of course, is, we're going to have to have a picture. There you uh, go. Lost and found. Human you, human urine, say that three times faster. Human urine could be used as eco-friendly crop fertilizer. Crop fertilizer. Yeah, okay. but I did. If you if you store this stuff for a year, yeah, and then and then you use it on the land, then it's yeah. actually a lot better for the land than traditional uh, fertilizers. Mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna buy a farm so, uh, on it. Yeah, so for me, I mean, everybody has to have a wee, so surely that's going to be a. That is a short. If, they, if nothing else, that is a short. Everybody's got to have a wee. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Oh, you know, I love so, it. Yeah. I mean, years it's, years ago, it, years ago, of course, urine was it was a commodity, and it would be it would you'd leave a bucket outside your house, and the man would come along and take it away, mm -hmm. and use it in tanneries and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm waiting for the guy. I mean, used to have a milkman come in the morning. Now we have the urine man who yeah. comes to take my sample every day. And um, I wish you off. could have a sample. You wish you could have a sample every day. Drop a urine. Here's what I find. Here's what I find fascinating. It says urine is composed, which you kind of already knew, 95% water, in my case, yeah. scotch, same thing, um, yeah. with remaining 5% of um, aminium compound, making it a source of something or other nutrients bio, for micro Bioavailable yeah. nutrients. Thank yeah. you yeah. For, uh, for plant growth. I think that's really cool. So theoretically, you could pee in a bottle and a year later, it on your plants look at what we we've saved the planet once again yeah yeah, yeah. it's got it's definitely a uh a found urine a dollar that is, yeah. I found, that is, found something um i was gonna i was gonna add i know michael collins is coming in november i think next week sorry fans is just us um but Mike, i think michael collins is going to be the first friday in november so that'll be an interesting show. Michael, our Michael, will hopefully be back and everything is okay with his um his family. And if not, then he'll take less Viagra next time. Um, and that's yeah. it. And I always have well, a, and Guy will be back. I will have him back after the election to give us his thoughts because I think I that'll be a shout out shout out to Dawn because she's she's put in the comments. Yeah, uh, port potties already do that here. They put it on our farms. So nice. Uh, Where's know, that? Uh, Dawn. Dawn's Dawn, one of our fans. Dawn is our fan. Dawn follows. I where? Tell you where, where? Where? I don't I, know what Dawn where, lives. I, I, America. I, I, she I, I, does I, live in America. So, that's all I do. So, wait, so, so port potties. Oh, that's one to be for everybody to Google. Uh, in which case, you just call them up and say, "Come and take my wee." So, um, wow. 
you know, they pay you. Great, great, great for students. Could have a certain instant supply all day, every day. But going to old age pensioners' homes, you'll have to wait. Just saying. There you go. There you go. Guys, as always, before we leave, don't forget to subscribe and like. We're live every Friday. We rebroadcast on Saturday. Saturday is also when we put out the podcast. So if you don't want to look at us, you can listen to us. Um, once again, thank you to Guy Standing. Guy will be back sometime in November. We'll try to give you a heads up. Michael Collins, I think, is here the first Friday. Uh, Corey.com is here in January to go over some stuff. So Corey will be back. And if you are somebody that has a clue, like a guy standing and you want to be a guest on our show, reach out to the show and we will make it happen for you. And that's it, guys. Anything else? No, that's it. Yeah. Dave wants that's to mention it, the I merch think. page. Yeah. Yeah, you got you can yeah, there's a there's a merch there's a merch ad for that, but we can do that at another time. But great, right. no, like listen, we're already running long. Let's run the merch ad. Okay. There you go. There's our merch event. And now, everybody have a wonderful day.